The main thing we're going to do today is talk about storage, both how things are stored physically on a machine, which you don't actually have to worry about for Palm Set 4, although you're certainly relying on having physical storage, and how to provide abstractions to storage, which is the main goal of a file system. Why is storage hard? Storage seems like it should be a real simple thing. The property that we want is just we can write some value and at some later time we can go back to the storage system and read that and get the same value back. Really simple interface. Why is it complicated? There are lots of real world problems. Okay, so that's I, in some sense that's what it means to say it's complicated. So why are there lots of real world problems to cope with to provide this simple storage that we want? Yes, physics. Um, maybe, but then the electrical engineers and people can worry about all that. And once we get to the level where we're actually implementing storage, if you're designing a processor. Someone needs to understand the physics who's designing the very low level, how do you make a transistor? But once you've got transistors, you don't really need to worry about quantum physics. You hope the transistors work like they're supposed to. So I'm not quite buying that answer yet, although it might be on the right track. You have to figure out where to, you have to, figure out where to put everything. OK, why does it matter where you put things? We're sort of getting to th things that, that definitely start to answer this question, right? So that. The fact that you're storing things in a physical medium, so physics does matter, because the time it takes for you to do things is going to depend on how things are stored in that physical medium and where they are. I haven't yet heard the answer I want to hear about why it gets complex. What I would encourage you to think more about, then, so you're all engineers and scientists, so you're thinking about things like quantum physics and decisions about where to store things. What you should be thinking about as engineers as well is about money. If we didn't care about money, would storage be complicated? OK, good. Yeah, so what really makes storage complicated is because of physics and engineering and all of these other things, they are very different design points in terms of the cost of storing things in different physical media and the performance trade-offs you get from that. If you didn't care about cost, you get a very simple storage system which is store everything the same way in RAM. Now everything's moving at the speed of light. There's some questions about how far away something is in, in RAM, but that's not usually relevant. Right? If you can get everything in a fast cache close to the processor, then you would be OK. Now the size of that cache is limited, but it's mostly limited by money. Right? The cost of having a bit in RAM is many, many order, orders of magnitude higher than the cost of having a bit on a disk drive. So that's what makes storage complicated, is all these cost trade-offs that to get good performance without something costing trillions of dollars, if you want to get good performance, you've got to do complicated things. That's always been the case. And we're going to look a little bit at the history of how storage was done. And then we'll look at what things are like today and how that impacts the design of the abstractions the operating system provides. A very early way to store data in computers was a delay line. All a delay line is, is a really long wire. Here's our really long wire that things can move around. So some medium moves around that wire. And when it gets to the end of it, you can read it. So you put something in, it goes around that wire. That's storing it through the course of that wire. So the way that would work, you need something that can put a value on the wire. So that's like a speaker. And you need something that can read the value on the wires that goes around. If you want to store it for a long time, well, you need to connect those two. So every time it goes around the loop, you're going to be able to read that value. You can get a 0 or 1 out. And then you can re-excite the speaker if you want to keep the same value there. So that's what a delay line is. This was what many of the early computers used for storage. So this is Maurice Wilkes. And these are delay lines. I'll have a link to what Maurice Wilkes wrote for his Turing Award essay. He talks about the experience of programming machines that use memory like this. Recent Turing Award winners don't have personal experience with Alan Turing, but Maurice Wilkes did. We mostly think of Turing as a theoretician. He came up with the whole thing problem with the abstract Turing machine model with all these big theoretical ideas. But he was also an engineer. And he was also someone very talented at programming 
not just the abstract machines, but the real machines. And one of the things you had to do with these memories that were delay lines, so you didn't just have one bit going around the way I showed you here. You can have many bits going around at once. So you could have one bit here, you could have one bit here, and you could fit, at least in the designs of these machines, 32 bits going around, and you had to know the time to read the bit. Each bit was going around. If the bit that you wanted was this one, well, it's going around this delay line. You've got to wait until the other 30 bits go by before you can read that one. One of the things you had to do to program well in those days was you had to actually think about the rhythm of your delay lines to try to write a program so you're reading the values you need when they're getting to the right part of the delay line. People complain about having to think about multiple level cache hierarchies to get good performance from memory systems today. Back in those days, you had to think about not just you know, where things are and how close they are. The time it took to access something at particular points was different. You wanted to access this value every 32 cycles, or uh, depending on your delay line, you want to write your code so you were interleaving your accesses in a way that worked well. And at least according to Wilkes, Turing was really, really clever at figuring out ways to do that to get good performance. So certainly not just the kinds of abstract programming for Turing machines. That's a pretty hard way to write programs, and it's pretty inefficient to have to wait for your bits to come around this delay line. Why did they use mercury? What are the design issues if you're doing storage with the delay line? So what properties of your design are going to impact how much data you can store and how long it takes to get the bit that you want? Assuming you're not as brilliant as Turing was at figuring out how to write your program to look for bits at the right time. So what impacts how long it takes to read the bit that you want? Yes. So, so this speaker and microphone are actually more literal than you think. It was actually sound waves in this. So what matters is the speed that things travel. In this case, it's the speed of sound. Right, so you would like some medium that sound travels pretty fast through. So air would be good for that. Sound travels really fast through air. Is air a good choice for this? Why do you want to use something more expensive and more toxic like mercury instead of air? Air is pretty cheap, so we don't mind if we leak some, but it's not that robust, right? It's hard to know that you're reliably going to get the same bit out as you put in if it's air. So you want something stable and fast, and mercury is better than water for that, at least at the right temperature. So that's why mercury was used. But you could have used lots of different things, anything that sound travels through as a potential choice. Turing's main contribution to the physical design of this was he thought you should use gin. It actually has the right properties for sound to travel well through it, and it gives a good speed at room temperature as well. The reason I'm telling you this story, if you're ever in an institution where they're sort of puritanical about having alcohol around your lab or office, you just need to tell them you're studying delay lines, and you can get this reference from Turing about why it's very important to have gin or other kinds of alcohol in your lab to do that. Waiting for bits to come around is a pretty painful thing, right? Even if you've got a good medium and you like having lots of gin around, it makes programming more complicated or you just have to wait for the bit you need. So the big advance that came after that was magnetic core memory. And magnetic core memory has this great property. You can read any bit you want. You don't have to wait. And the reason you can read any bit you want, you've got all your bits arrayed in some array, and you can set the wires in the right way to read whatever's at any of those locations in that 2D grid of bits. The first computer to deploy this in a large-scale way was MIT's Project Whirlwind, which we, I think, talked about in the history of operating systems. So this was what was used as part of the SAGE system to do tracking the potential bombers coming in from the Soviet Union in the Cold War to try to get to interactive computing where you could get real-time results from that. So there was a strong motivation to make memory fast, this is what the magnetic core memory that was built for Project Whirlwind was doing. The idea here is quite similar to modern memory. And so we're going to switch to talk about modern SRAM. 